I almost forgot to get rid of my gum. You need to be hearing my chomping through the whole class. We don't want that. Okay, so we're in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And we finished at verse 10. Um, where we were talking about uh, Saul getting a new heart and all that. That's kind of where we, where we finished off. Um, so we'll read, we'll stand and read uh, verse 11 to the end of the chapter, I guess. So we'll read from 11 to 27. And then uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse number 11, And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said to one another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said, To seek the asses. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto thee. And Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly that the asses were found, but of the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpah, and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all kingdoms, and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And when Samuel had ca caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, the son, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. Samuel said to all the people, See him whom the Lord hath chosen, and there is none like him among all the people, for that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, and wrote it in a book, and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. And the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Lord, we're thankful for this opportunity to once again crack open your book and learn some of these principles that are found here um, in the establishment of the kingdom and um, the principles that we can learn in all this now. And we ask that you bless our time together now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated there. So. Last week we finished the, the, the uh, class off talking about the, the Lord giving um, Saul a new heart. And, you know, we uh, made the correlation between that and the new man and the new heart that we're given when we're born again. And uh, that's how we kind of wrapped it up last week. So in verse number, number 10, you see that, And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among, among them. And, of course, that was... Uh, a fulfillment of what Samuel said was going to happen. He told Saul this is what's going to happen. Um, and it happened. So this is proving to Saul that what Samuel told him truly is from God. So the gravity of, of the, the thing is likely falling upon Saul at this point where he's realizing, yeah, this, this is all going down exactly as Samuel said it would. Verse number 11, And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets? Is Saul also among the prophets? So this kind of took people by surprise because they kind of knew who their prophets were in general. And all of a sudden this, you know, young man who was nothing but like a sheep herder or, a, or a, uh, the donkey, you know, the asses, 
taking care of the animals of a farmer or whatever, all of a sudden he's a prophet? What in the world is going on here? Where, where'd this guy come from? You know, what's going on here? So obviously the people saw something was going on, something is happening. They don't quite understand what that is, but they just uh, notice that it is. Um, and so they ask these questions. Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. So it doesn't tell us what he was prophesying about, but um, he was. He was fitting right in with the prophets. He had this new heart. He became another man, and he started prophesying. Um, and like I mentioned last week, you know, in a sense, that's kind of what happens to you and I when we get born again. In a sense, now we're not we're not prophesying with a C where we're giving prophecy and telling the future, but prophesying all of a sudden you want to tell people about Jesus. You know what? Did you not have people ask you, you know, what happened to that guy or what is different about you? I mean, I, again, I can only speak to my experience, but that's exactly what happened when I got saved. Now they weren't using the same terminology. What are you one of the prophets? Is what's going on? They didn't say that. But because they don't even know that terminology, to even know that, you know, to even say that. But there's, well, I don't want to say should because everybody's salvation experience is different. But I'm just pointing out that it shouldn't be uncommon when people get born again for the same type of thing to happen to where people can notice that something's different, something's going on. God is doing something. This is not something natural this is something supernatural this is different this is what is going on with this guy he's not the same and again i pointed out the distinction between how obvious that would appear between say the salvation of a nine-year-old and that of a 50-year-old you know what i mean i mean the, the glaring contrast would be be much different you know much more noticeable because a child does, isn't really overtly doing a whole lot that a child doesn't normally do anyway um, but anyway so you know the people notice that something's happened to Saul they don't quite know what it is verse number 12 and one of the same place answered and said but who is their father therefore it became a proverb is Saul also among the prophets so it just sort of became a, the hubbub of the town you know is Saul also among the prophets um, verse number 13, And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said unto him, so his uncle must have lived near there, And Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said to seek the asses. And when he saw that they were not were nowhere, we, and when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And, Saul, and so he's just repeating what we already know, right? You know, we were looking... Look, Dad told us to go out and look for him, so we went out and looked for him. We couldn't find him. Then we went to Samuel. So then the uncle follows up with another question. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. So now he's interested. Now, what in the world did Samuel say? I mean, wow, you, you went to the high priest. You went to the, the judge of Israel. What did he say? And it says here, verse 16, And Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly that the asses were found, but the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. So he only told him the part that was relevant to what he was out doing. He was searching for the asses, his father's flock, or whatever you call a group of asses, I don't know. <laughs> a gaggle. I mean, who knows? Uh, um, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. It's the first time I ever thought of that. But anyway, so, you know, he went out looking for him. And uh, he didn't find him, so they went to Samuel. He tells his uncle all about, you know, that part, but he didn't tell him about the kingdom part, right? I don't know if this is a sign of Saul's humility or if it's uh, his trepidation. Like, he wants, he knows that it needs to really come from Samuel. I, I'm not going to walk around and tell everybody that Samuel made me king. You know, that'd be like somebody <clears throat> walking up to you at work and saying, well, I'm the boss now. Well, and I want you to do this. Um, well, wait a minute. Like, are you just like making yourself the boss, or like, did an actual boss make you the boss? I mean, is, is like anybody with power make you the boss, or are you just making this up yourself? You know, you're not going to listen to somebody who just walks up and says, "I'm your boss now." You know, I mean, it doesn't work like that. 
it has to be sanctioned by the authorities that this is your boss, okay? And that's how it works, you know. You, you, the bosses will come and say, okay, we're introducing, you know, Rufus here, this is your new, you know, manager. So, you know, whatever he wants you to do, do, because he's now, you know, speaking for us. That's how it works, right? So <clears throat> I think Saul had enough sense here to, to not tell because he wants to make sure it's done officially first. I think there's some wisdom in that, you know. He knows what's getting ready to happen. He knows that he's been made the king uh, by Samuel, but he's not going to go around spilling the beans on that. He's going to let the proper order be done, and that's that's the good way of doing it. There's some wisdom in that. He's, he's going to let it play out and let Samuel be the one to tell everybody that he's the king. <clears throat> now, it doesn't tell us exactly that's what he's thinking, but... There's a reason, right? There's a reason why Saul didn't tell his uncle. So then we're left to try to wonder, well, why didn't he tell his uncle? There's something there. So you kind of have to speculate a little bit. But we know how it plays out. Samuel does announce it to the nation. So I think Saul had just enough sense to just let it play out um, the way that it should play out. And a humble person would do that. Uh, an egomaniac would not. They would. They would come around and they would let you know I'm the boss now. You know. So I think this is. Yeah, I think this is kind of showing some good character on Saul's part. We know the, how this all ends too. It doesn't end well for Saul. We all know that. I mean, you should know that. I'm assuming you've all read your Bibles at least once. So you 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 know how this all ends. But at least it's off to a good start. He he seems to be off to a good start. <clears throat> By the way, many of you have likely heard that saying, you know, how's it go there? Uh, power corrupts absolutely, or how's it go? Uh, amp what's that? Power corrupts and absolute power. Corrupts absolutely, yeah. I, you know, that comes from people who've read the Bible. <laughs> or experience, right. life experience. You know, you, you, you power, you get a guy, man, this is going to be the best boss I ever had, and then six months later, the guy's a nightmare. Right. Amen. Right, because it's gone to his head. <clears throat> People don't know how to handle power. You're seeing it play out in our country right now. It's just absolutely corrupted. The whole system is completely corrupted on both sides. Mm -hmm. It's corrupted. It's, it's all about power, and, it's, and the power is supposed to rest in our hands. You know, the government's not supposed to mandate you wear a mask. They're just not supposed to, period. Right. You know, they can make suggestions. Here's what we think is good. Here's what the scientists have said. You know, if, if you really were a person who cared about your neighbors, you'd, you know, use some wisdom. But to demand that you wear a mask, that's, to me, I, it makes no sense whatsoever. Because you're responsible for your safety. I'm not. Right. So if I want to go stand on a cliff and take a picture, well, I might fall and I want to be reckless, that's on me. You don't get to tell me, no, you can't go on that hill, you know. What, where does that end? Next thing you know, you're in a cage for your own safety. Right. Right, because you're safe there, right? As long as somebody brings you food and water, you're safe. No, life is fraught with risks. Um, without risks, there's no reward. With not, without, it's risk takers that run everything. It's risk takers that are the best leaders. You now, there's fools that take risks, too, but... They get weeded out. <laughs> they win the Darwin Award, you know, and <laughs> life moves on. But, you know, most of your heroes or whatever that have ever done anything like amazing, <clears throat> like a Christopher Columbus or a Neil Armstrong, or they took risks, right? They took risks, put their life on the line, and it all is for the betterment of society in the end. Um, so when, when government starts denying risks and demanding you don't take risks, then they're demanding that you have your own ability to make decisions for yourself. Well, who made you my mom? You know what I mean? Who made you my dad? Yeah, you know, my mom, not my dad. I can take my own safety into my own hands. If you want to be safe, then you stay home. Or you uh, wear your mask. Or you stay six feet away from me. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, me, I wear my mask. I wear a mask at work all day long. Why? Because 
that's what my boss wants me to do and I think it's courteous to the people around me that are nervous so I do it's the mandate is what I'm talking about the mandate there's something wrong with that amount of power to mandate that Absolutely. that's where the problem comes in well I can't you trust people to be wise sure there's tons of fools but I guess the problem now is is that half our country or most of our country is full of juveniles 70 year old juveniles 50 year old juveniles just totally just reckless people that care about nothing they have no wisdom no discernment and that should be expected when you get people that grow up hating God hating the Bible all the source of all wisdom they just dismiss thousands of years of wisdom and learning uh, and decide they're going to blaze some new utopian trail and it's just, it's just so ridiculous when you look at it from afar you're just going bad you know these people are blazing a trail over a cliff quick and they don't even know it so Saul displays you know um, some wisdom here so it's off to a good start uh, but he doesn't tell his uncle there um, verse number 16 about um, the kingdom verse number 17 and Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpah and said unto the children of Israel thus saith the Lord God of Israel I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you and ye have this day rejected your God who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations and ye have said unto him nay but set a king over us now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands now this is pretty interesting in verse number 18 where the word oppressed shows up because that seems to be a a popular word at the moment um, in America oppression and so and so oppressed so and so and so and so oppressed so and so and everybody's a victim of oppression and all this other kind of stuff well what was the, what was the answer to that oppression it was the Lord the Lord will deliver anybody out of oppression um, but our country has forsaken the remedy for oppression so even if they were right they've rejected the solution you know what I mean I mean the middle wall of partition that's been between people forever not just Jews and Gentiles but Gentiles and Gentiles and Jews and Gentiles you know that happened in the church for the first time in history in the church through Jesus Christ that that partition of of race and ethnicity was broken down this was the revolutionary point that Jesus came to bring to the world this idea that we can all if we can all grab hold of Jesus then we have the ultimate bond the ultimate glue that can just kill all that that's uh, different all the differences right so right now the Christians in this country should all be rallying around Christ you know not Republicans not Democrats but around Jesus and unfortunately that's not happening at least Martin Luther King tried that route and I think that's kind of why he was successful because Christians kind of rallied around that not all because there were some people that were using the Bible for their own ends to oppress people they were using the Bible but you get the point that commonality is what M MLK was, was uh, appealing to. You know, this is something that you could get with, right? Like if, if we were alive then, kind of even knowing what we know now, if we could hear him speak now, you'd, you'd, you'd be amen. And listen, I know about the personal issues that he had, and, you know, that doesn't change what I just said. <laughs> it doesn't change what I just said. You know, it, it doesn't. So even if all that stuff were true and he wasn't the greatest uh, person in his private life, I'm talking about the message, okay? The message was something that you could get with, for the most part. And I think that's why he was successful, because he was, he was trying to create unity. But what we got going on now is people asking for segregation. And it's like, wait a minute, I thought we were trying to fix that. <laughs> So the solution is more segregation? So um, division. Well, you know division's not of the Lord. 
The Lord is about unity, man. But that can only be achieved through Jesus. You're never going to get unity about anything without Jesus. I mean, you see some of the most, you can even see it in like, um, this is simplistic, it is kind of overly simplistic example, but like even in like sports, you can get teams that are rivals that hate one another, and boy, they really want to just crush the other team. But then in the last, you know, 15, 20 years or whatever, you started to see even these rivals meet at the middle of the field and pray. Because they found something they could unite around. Instead of hating to that level to where we can't, there was like this common bond, which I thought was pretty cool to see. Um, so whether or not they all believe the right stuff is not my point. My point was that, that Jesus can be a unifying factor and the Lord is the one that can help people with their oppression. And that oppression might not go away for generations, but that's the pathway to being freed from oppression. Um, we only look at our own personal lifetime, but we got to stop doing that because that's not how God sees things. He's got a long game, right? So when we don't get things we want now, it, it doesn't mean that we were failures. It doesn't mean that it's not you're not doing right because you didn't see the results. But what about your great great grandkids? If you get your if you get yourself on the right pathway, then you, you know the end is going to be good if you're plugged in the narrow way with Jesus. Anyway, so this all started out great. Here's Samuel. He's invoking the word of the Lord. He's telling these people, reminding them that it was the Lord that saved them out of their oppression. But they didn't want the Lord anymore. They wanted their king. So he's reminding them of what he had told them before that all these bad things that are going to happen when you get a king. There's some good things, and you're going to see the good things here shortly as we get into chapter 11. And there's some good things in our world today that have come out of that. Um, but it's not the ideal. It's just making the best out of a bad situation. So um, verse number uh, 19, uh, Samuel continues to say, And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all all your adversities and your tribulations, and ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, or Matri, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further. If the man should yet come inquired of the Lord further if the man should yet come thither and the Lord answered behold, behold he hath hid himself among the stuff now what this stuff is I don't know what the stuff is but he hid himself maybe the people dropped off all their wagons and everything when they came to you know because they came from all over the tribes right so they, you know you look at your map they're coming a long way so I'm sure they're carrying some supplies or whatever you know, and maybe that's the stuff. But either either way, he was bashful, or he was anxious, or he was nervous, or we we don't know why he wasn't forefront. But again, I think this is a good sign of his of his character that he wasn't already standing there in the front, just going, "Yeah, yeah, I can't. All right, gotta say my name, you know. <laughs> Hurry up, and, and, you know, I'm ready." You know, he didn't have that attitude. That's what we can pull out of this. Um, he was hiding. He hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. So again, um, we see that this is an outward appearance type of thing. He was the biggest person. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, and there is none like him among all the people. And the people shouted and said, God save the king. Now you kind of know where England gets their right. phrase. Amen. God save the queen. God save the king. It comes right from here. Right. It's a biblical tradition that they've carried along all this time. It comes right out of the Bible. And they said, God save the king. Um, so the people were happy. 
with what the Lord presented them. And um, verse 25, And Samuel told the people the manner of, manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Now, it doesn't tell us what this book is, but I think it's interesting. Wow, Samuel wrote a book about all this stuff. And it could be Second Samuel. It could be the, all, all the things that we read about until he dies. That could have been it. Um, but we don't know. It doesn't say 100% what he wrote. Um, but he did write. So that just goes to show you, you know, that it's, it's smart to write things down once in a while. People need to know their history. Right? Samuel, in his wisdom, understood that people needed to know what, what went down. People need to know their history. And so you should know your history. You should know history. I mean, probably 80% of our problem in this country right now is people don't know history. Right. And why do you think it's history that's being twisted? Because they know how important it is that you know your history. So if they can pervert history, then they can really mess you up. Because it does, it does kind of uh, guide your pathway of, of moving forward is what you think about the past. I mean, you see that in your own history, in your own personal history. Well, I'll just give you some vague examples and hypotheticals. You know, there's people that, that have been hurt in relationships, and so that affects their relationships for the rest of their life. Right. Why? Because their history informs them <laughs> differently than other people's histories inform them. So they know their personal history, and it affects how they walk. Right? That's a fact. Nobody can deny that. Everybody knows that. I think that's a base level where we all can understand that. So that idea that history guides how you walk, that's true. And Samuel understood that. So he wrote it down in a book. A constitution. Hmm? He gave him a constitution. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, a constitution, just like our constitution. But our constitution is based on so much history that if you don't know the history that it's based on, then you can misinterpret even the constitution, and that's exactly what's happening. For example, they'll say things like the constitution, Obama said this last week, the constitution uh, allowed for slavery. Well, that's kind of a really weird way to read that. Yeah. <laughs> Factually, it did. It did allow for slavery, three-fifths, it did. You, you can't deny that. It did allow for slavery. But if that's what you think that it was written for, then you're missing a whole lot. The three-fifths thing was actually a good thing because it was designed to deny power to the slave owners in Congress because of the counting for representatives in Congress. The founders knew slavery was bad. You look at their writings, even they owned them, they still knew it was bad. Some of them freed their slaves before they died. But the point is, is you're not going to tell Virginia and South Carolina and Georgia to join a union and tell them that you can't have slaves. That there would have never been in America. So they knew the long game. Let's play the long game. We're already on a path to getting rid of it, right? It's going to take a little while, a couple generations probably. So let's at least do what we can politically to at least unify so that the, the European powers stop trying to oppress us over here. Because, you know, France was a player, Spain was a player, Britain was a player. There was still all that stuff going on. But most people don't know that because I mean I shouldn't have to give this history, really to be honest with you. But there's so much going on. Think about it. If the South had been given the ability to count all the slaves who didn't have a vote, but to count them 100%, they would have had more power in Congress and you may never have seen the end of slavery as quickly as it came. So this was, a, this was a political tactic to keep power in the North where the abolitionists were 
so that over the, over the long term, they could finally, as people and uh, society changes and moves forward, as Europe was already doing with their abolitionist movement, that they could play this game of chess and end slavery once and for all. And that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly what happened. So it was a good thing, but it was bad. Right? I mean, it was bad, yes. but it was good. It's not that simple, is the point. You see how complex that is? So when, when people say, when the people just make comments like that, it allowed for slavery, the implication is that its purpose was to perpetuate slavery, was to embrace slavery, was to further slavery and empower slavery. No. It was to end slavery. And it was used that way. You start seeing the Monroe Doctrine comes in. You start seeing as new states started coming in. Then there was the battle over whether they could have slaves or not have slaves. The states were... I mean, if you know history, you know what I'm saying. And in your heart, you're going, yeah, amen, this is simple. This makes total sense. But because we don't really know what was going on at that time and what preceded all that stuff, then you really don't know and you're looking at it from 2020, and you're looking at that document, and you're going, what a racist document. <laughs> and I understand how that is the appearance. From a position of ignorance, that definitely is the appearance, and that's why half of America is confused by that. Because they don't know their history. It's the same with Christopher Columbus and some of the atrocities that were associated with him, but do you know all about him? Do you all know what he said? No, you don't. And if you don't, well then you really don't know what he did and why it was good and how he rebuked those things. And do you know what the Spanish did? And do you know how many slaves the Spanish brought to, to, to the Caribbean and to South America? And it was like hundreds of millions more than, the, than America ever allowed on the continent. Right. But, you know, it's America's the source of all this bad stuff. I mean, it, it, it's just... You know, I, I can't give a, a world history lesson right now. That's not my point. It's supposed to be teaching the Bible, but I'm trying to point out the fact that, you know, not everything appears on the surface as it is. If you know your history, you really know what's going on. If you know the long game, starting with the Greeks and the Romans, and then, then of course, uh, Judaism here, and the Bible, and you put it all together, and then the churches come into play, and you see all this stuff come in, and, and then it ends up with British common law and the Magna Carta, and it works itself across Europe, and then the battle with the Catholics and the Protestants and the Anabaptists, and, and you understand how that's all played a role, and then uh, Christians fleeing to come here. You had Catholics coming here. Those were white people that were Catholics that were trying to spread Catholicism, but there were also pilgrims that came here. We had a totally different agenda, which was to evangelize people with the gospel. And you got all these different things going on. There's no such thing as the white guys did this. Because the white guys didn't even agree with each other. The Quakers came over and they were abolitionists. My forefathers were Quakers. They didn't own slaves. They were against it. They were flat out against it. And then died freeing slaves. That's my personal family history. But somehow, because I'm white, it's all, it's all thrown away. I guess I'm just lumped in with all these other people. It's just so, it's so stupid. It's just so stupid. It's not that simple. It doesn't work like that. I think you guys are mature enough to understand what I'm saying. It is a sensitive subject. I mean, I'm talking about stuff that really is f forbidden. You know, we're not even really supposed to talk about this so stuff. Many of us are really mixed race anyway. I mean, e exactly. If you find your, follow your limit, Jones, all of us are mixed race. Right. I mean, uh, I'll just make a, a quick comment about that. You know, you've got uh, like Hispanics, right? That there would be no such thing as Hispanics if the Spaniards hadn't come and, and colonized South America. They're half oppressor, half slave. I mean, that's right. That's, that's a fact. They're Spanish because the Spanish came down to where the Incas and the other various ethnicities were and intermingled. And so you wouldn't have one Hispanic if it weren't for Spain colonizing the South, South America. So Spain and Portugal. So, you know, that stuff is just totally ignored. 
so then you talk about the battle of you know Mexico and Alamo and uh, the white dudes came and they stole the land from the from what the other slave owners kids I mean where does it stop it's not that simple but people are so simple because they don't know history that they buy the lines that people sell them and using race to stir people up, to cause trouble for other reasons, and it's clear as the nose on your face what's really going on, and there's nothing you can do about it because people are so ignorant. So you pull your hair out a little bit and pray, because that's all you can do, because it's going sideways fast. But that let me get back to the main unifier. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the unifier. He, can, he ends all of this, all of this nonsense. Everything that I just said doesn't mean anything to any of us today when we hold together in the name of Christ. None of it means anything. And it's not going to mean anything in eternity, right? I mean, because we're all going to be brothers and sisters forever and ever and ever and ever, and we won't have to talk about this you know, you want to say stupid stuff, but unfortunately it's very important. Um, division. That's what Satan does. He divides. Right. And that's exactly what's going on. So Samuel wrote a book. And so he put some importance on history and words and how important it is to know that stuff. And he laid it up before the Lord and Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So no matter what you do, no matter whether the Lord's in it or not, you're going to have enemies right out of the gate. You just are, you're going to, I mean, Saul hasn't even done anything yet. He's already got enemies. Yeah. <laughs> That's because everybody's got an opinion. <laughs> That's right. So there's a lesson to learn there. You know, the Lord calls you to do something. Just automatically understand, you know, it's not a popularity contest. You're going to have enemies right away. You're going to have enemies right away. And that's just all the way it's always been with the people of God. I've always had enemies. Um, and so Saul's got enemies, and he hasn't even said a word yet. And there's already people against them. But they get theirs later, and Saul handles it very well in chapter 11. He does. So, uh, but the children of Allah said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So Saul didn't say anything. These guys didn't like him, but he didn't go off on them. He just held his peace. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. So this is why I, why I have the map. Um, Jabesh Gilead is way up here and I'm in the upper right hand corner. Jabesh Gilead is way up here. And they're down here at Mizpah, right? You know, that's where we were just last at in the narrative. And way up there, the Ammonites came. Now, if you remember when we went through Judges chapter 21, you remember when the concubine divided up, and not the concubine, the, the husband of the concubine, the Levite, divided up the concubine and, and, and uh, spread her al along the uh, 12 tribes to avenge what happened um, at Gibeah. The Jabesh Gileadites didn't show up. So they were pretty much about wiped out, and it were their women that were given to the men that survived out of the tribe of Benjamin. Right? If you need a refresher, just go back and read chapters 19, 20, and 21 of Judges. So in the tribe of Benjamin, who Saul is a member of, their mamas are all from Jabesh Gilead. Or most of the mothers are from Jabesh Gilead. Um, from a couple generations previous. So their daddies are Benjamites, but their, their moms and grandmas all are from Jabesh Gilead. So that's kind of important to understand because Saul's going to get pretty upset 
when he hears what's happening to Jabesh Gilead. Now, who are the Ammonites? Who are the Ammonites? The Ammonites are the children of Lot. Remember Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah and that whole bit? And the angel came and took Lot out of the city. His wife turned back when she wasn't supposed to and she turned into a pillar of salt. But his daughters escaped with him and then the horror of all horrors and craziness of all craziness. He ends up having children with his two daughters. Bizarre world, but fact. Right? And um, one of the children was Ammon. So these are Gentiles because the covenant of circumcision was given to Abraham only, not Lot, who was Abraham's nephew. But Lot wasn't given the covenant of circumcision. Only Abraham's family was. So these are Gentiles, but they're sort of related. But the Ammonites come up against the Jabesh Gileadites there, this Nahash guy, uh, and look at what they say. Make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. So immediately they're already subversive. You know, They're like, oh man, we're going to get our butts whooped here. Make a covenant and we'll be your slaves, basically is what they're saying. We'll be your servants. I mean, we, we can't beat you. You know, we'll be your servants. Again, this is normal. This is normal. And again, this also is a display of how men are going to determine the, few, the uh, life of their women. Because you think these, okay, so these Jabesh Gileadites are like, okay, we'll be your servants. Well, what do you think that's going to mean to their families? Their women are then going to be sub subject to the whims of the Ammonites. Right? right? So, you know, women weren't, weren't like falling in love with Prince Charming. They were just taken, sold. And uh, again, so, you know, how the women in the West or the United States have, can ever entertain how horrible they have it is to me is an insult to the society that our our men set up through Jesus Christ. The idea of one man one woman was it comes from Jesus. Now it's from God in Genesis, right? But it wasn't practiced. You see all the men with multiple wives in the in the even in the Israelites, right? So that idea of Prince Charming dying for his wife, that's, that's Jesus who died for his. So that you have a, a man or a father or a husband that cares for you, you can thank Jesus for that. Because your life is an anomaly compared to the billions of women that have born and lived and died before you. And um, our men, and I'm talking about our forefathers of the United States, through the scripture, the scripture gets the credit, right? It's not, it's not Europeans that get the credit, it's the scriptures that get the credit. Um, by implementing, implementing God's ways, it has blessed the, the women of the, those societies that follow God's ways. And this kingdom is kind of like a precursor to where I'm going to head with this next week because I'm going to wrap it up. I'm out of time. The idea that you have a nation state in the first place is a good thing because that's what allows a man to only need one wife because he doesn't need 10 or 15 to protect himself from all the other men. Because the, the, the state takes care of that protection. So then I can just do what I'm supposed to do in Christ. Is to love my wife and provide for my wife and our children. That's only possible with the setup that you have now. And if you destroy it, you're destroying yourself. And so half the country is traveling headlong to their own destruction right now. They don't even know why. And it's a very broad thing that I'm talking about right now. But I think you guys all understand it. So it's a big, wide, long game thing that's taken thousands of years to get here. But we're talking about 2020 like it just happened in a vacuum. And, and we got here just because kids went to college. It's way bigger than that. And it's satanic. All right, we'll wrap it up right there. We'll start chapter 11 next week. We'll, we'll talk about what happens here with Nahash, the Ammonites, and the Jabesh Gileadites, and uh, Israel, and 
it's how Saul comes to the rescue. All right, let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for your words here. We're thankful for all that you've done. We're thankful for all the generations that have come before us and all the messy history and all the evil and the sin and the darkness that's in this world. And definitely Satan is the god of this world because of all the mess that we have to even know about. And We're just thankful for the little bit of light that we do have through your book. And it's a lot of light. So, Lord, help us to grab hold of that. Help us to find the glue in Jesus. Help us to, to remember that and, and, and to account for our Christian family as our first most importance, Lord, um, and that it can be our glue and our binding uh, with one another. Help us to have unity, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.